Welcome to this morning's Jerusalem Press Club webinar in the series, The Scoop on Annexation or Sovereignty. Uh, we've decided to deviate from our usual format today and we'll be hearing from a few different speakers with one thing in common. Uh, they all live in areas that may be directly affected by the application of Israeli sovereignty to parts of Judea and Samaria. Opinions, however, coming out of the West Bank are not uniform. Uh, our guests today have kindly agreed to share their thoughts and feelings about the impending move. So they give a clear picture of the topography. We're sharing a map of the area. Perfect. Uh, I'd just like to point out that the uh, map has been provided by the Benjamin Council and shows mostly Jewish communities. Um, so we'll, we'll keep the map up there for a while. I think uh, up until each speaker has had a chance to answer at least one question and then we can take it down so you can focus uh, on the speakers themselves. Uh, so first, let me uh, invite uh, Simcha Schumacher, a resident of Ateret, which is north of Ramallah, uh, and effectively a Jewish enclave surrounded by Palestinian villages. Simcha, thanks for joining us this morning. Hi, good morning. Um, hi. Okay, so, and, um, yes. Sorry, go ahead. No, should I tell about myself or later? Uh, a little bit later. We're just going to introduce everybody first and then we'll go into questions. Um, we're also joined by Miri Maozavadia, a resident of Neve Tzuf. Uh, as you can see, all three areas are uh, located. It's, it's the one to the left of Ateret. It's a little bit blurry in the map, but it's, uh, it's west of Ateret. Uh, in full disclosure, Miri is the Benjamin Council's international spokesperson, so also a good resource to have in the future. Thanks for joining us, Miri. Uh, Miri, are you still on the line? Okay, we seem to have lost Miri. We'll come back to her in just a minute. This is the, uh, the pros and cons of doing things uh, online with a number of different speakers. Uh, so we'll get back to her. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Israel Meida, the resident of Shiloh, uh, which is in between uh, Nablus and Ramallah and uh, directly on Route 60, the main north-south ar north artery running through the West Bank. Thanks, Israel, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, uh, do we have Miri back on the line by any chance? Okay, so we're going to continue without her just, uh, just uh, so that we don't run over time. Uh, Rachel, you can take the map down now. I think we're going to focus on the speakers themselves. Um, let's begin with the pre-submitted questions. Um, and if anyone from our audience wants to ask a question throughout the discussion, please send yours to the chat box. Just make sure that the question is addressed to a specific panelist so that we can actually finish today. I see that Miri has joined us back on the line. So Miri, just if you can show yourself to the audience and say hi. Hi. Can I Great. see you all? <laughs> Great, okay. So our first, direct, our first question will actually be directed to Simcha. Um, the, tr the Trump plan pairs annexation of Israeli land with the establishment of a Palestinian state. What is the greatest concern you have for your family if this happens? Um, I think the biggest concern will be the roads. Um, today, I can, from my house, I can go to other areas um, with different roads, and they're talking about closing off uh, Road 60, it was the main road for us to go to uh, other places where schools, where my kids live, they learn, sorry, in Ofra, and where my parents uh, live in Malad Dumim. Uh, I think that's the main uh, issue right now. Okay, thanks. And I did say I would give you an opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit more, so please take this time to do that. No problem. Okay, so my name is Simcha Schumacher. Um, I'm 37. My parents are born in uh, Canada, in Toronto, did a Leah, uh before I was born. Uh, my parents live in Maled Dunim. I have uh, seven kids. Very cute kids. My oldest is 15 and a half, and my youngest is a year and three months. Um, I'm married to Ayelet. She is also 36. Um, we met uh, 19 years ago. I'm married 16. She's my, uh, my uh, high school sweetheart. And um, I live in a paradise called Ateret. Uh, and I have a company, Design Websites and Branding. I work mostly from home, and I have an uh, office in Modin, who is half an hour from Ateret. 
Okay, thanks for that. Uh, and um, Islan, my next question is for you, but again, if you can say a few words about yourself before, before we begin. Well, my name is Israel Medad. I've been living here in Shiloh since 1981. I've been in Israel since 1907 when I immigrated with my wife. And we're just uh, finished 50 years of uh, that relationship, moving on to the next. Uh, I'm retired, but I do continue to do research work at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, where I worked for the past almost 17 years. Lovely. Okay. Um, so my first question for you is that I'm sure, I'm sure you've had regular interactions with Palestinians over the years uh, in the area. How do you think this kind of move will affect day-to-day -day interactions if there still are any? What I have to uh, uh, confront that, uh, the interreactions between us and the local population have been severely curtailed by the imposition of the uh, Palestinian National Authority, uh, which uh, if not uh, arresting or torturing some of them who are in relationships with us, uh, prevent uh, the development, especially over the past 20 years, of normal social economic uh, relationships. We do have, uh, for example, here in Shiloh, maybe 100 Arab construction workers every day, but because of the security threats, it's very limited. Um, way back when, I'm talking about in the 1980s, we would have tea, coffee, visit, uh, visit on Arab neighbors, attend weddings even. Uh, but uh, the Israeli government at the time thought it was very smart to arm uh, the local Arabs. And instead of bringing peace, that brought terror, which was the second intifada, of course. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Miri, if you can just say one word before, uh, before our, the first question that's directed to you. About yourself? Oh, Miri, you're on mute. You're on mute, so just unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry, I apologize. My internet connection became really bad. It's nice to meet you all. My name is Miri Ovadia. I'm 33 years old. I have three kids. And I've been living in the community in Evetsov in the west of Benjamin ever since I was born. I've been working for the regional council for the last eight years. This is my home. It's always been my home, and I hope it will always remain our home. Very strong statement. Okay, um, so your neighbors and yourself have experienced more, more than one tragedy uh, at the hands of terrorists over the years. Are you not worried about the immediate violence that Israeli security officials and experts, both past and present, have warned is likely to erupt in the event of uh, announcement about Israeli sovereignty? Our excellent security departments have been working on different scenarios to make sure that the safety of the residents will be kept as they do on a regular basis. And definitely, uh, if we uh, understand that there may be a certain increase of violence, they deserve the change. That sovereignty is something that has, has to happen. We, um, but I think that we are already communities in a better um, situation and the, the act of extending sovereignty will bring us to a much, much better place. Okay. Um, Simcha, what are your thoughts on the upcoming, upcoming plans? Is this something that you support? Would you like to see it this, like this or in another form? Uh, we can't hear you, uh, so if you can try to improve your connection. Can you hear me better? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so I got my Bluetooth. Um, so I'm saying um, my issue right now is I'm not sure what the plans are. Um, it seems like no one really knows what the plans are. Uh, we're looking forward um, to uh, have a celebration. I forgot the word. I, my English is not 100%. Um, but again, if, if everything comes with, uh, with other stuff that we, we think are, is going to be dangerous for a terrorist or for Israel, um, that's going to be bad. But hopefully, 
so again, and we're not sure what the plans are. No one like, no one really told us. They're talking, you know, other people are talking, but we're not sure what the real plans will be. So have you, have you, um, this is a follow, follow up question to that. Have you and other residents around you voiced concern to your local leadership uh, about the fact that you have no idea what's going on about how these things will impact you directly? And do you feel that you are being uh, represented nationally with the local leadership on this topic specifically? So first of all, I, I am in the local uh, leadership in Ateret. So I'm part of the five people who take uh, who are, uh, in the leadership. Uh, we definitely have concerns, uh, concerns about what they're talking about, about uh, giving away 70% of the areas of the, of the roads. Um, that's our concern. We're concerned because we really don't know what's going to happen in the end. Um, so that's our main concern. Um, but hopefully we're, we're talking and we have a, actually we have a meeting next week um, speaking about what's going to be, but, but our really issue is we don't know what's going to be. Okay, uh, so the unknown. Um, yeah. Miri, uh, being in contact with many of the local, uh, other local community members, have you heard about any families uh, who are so concerned for their safety that they would relocate it as a result, like what we saw in the Gaza periphery over the last few years because of the uh, ongoing campaigns with Hamas? No, that's not at all the situation. I think, if anything, a lot of the people over here, um, they're not so familiar with the plan. They may be a bit indifferent. Uh, they don't see a major change happening anytime soon. I think the different leaderships of the communities in the Judea Maria are very involved on meeting with them to make their best, to make sure that their positive sides of the plan will be implied and to avoid the dangerous parts of the plan. I think that's our biggest uh, concern right now. But with the residents, I think life here is going on as it is. People are more um, concerned about a second wave of Corona and a lot of people that are unemployed because of the, the situation, it's more of the worry. Um, I think that if anything, when people do uh, come across the plan and the headlines here in Israel, they're very scared of what would it mean a Palestinian state and it will be surrounded by a Palestinian state. How can we continue safe? Uh, I think those are the type of fears, but it's not in the level in which people feel that they need to um, relocate because something's going to be happening next week. Okay, so just a follow-up question to something you mentioned and also related to what I asked Simcha. Uh, you said that you think that, or that you know of meetings that are happening between uh, the, the more senior representatives of, of the communities and the Prime Minister and his staff and government, um, but are those voices being heard? Do you believe that they are being um uh listen to in in the context of decision making or is it just blowing in the wind i believe it is because essentially this plan is supposed to create a huge change obviously for the state of israel but mostly for the half a million israelis who are living over here and often daily issues in our lives uh, become very complicated because the fact that this area is not governed by Israel in the, in the, in the full um, meaning of it. Um, so yes, I believe that the Prime Minister of Israel and the Israeli government, they want to achieve a plan that the leadership of the communities in Judea and Samaria that they support. If the people over here fight against the plan, I, I don't see a reason why the government will try and force us to receive a plan that is not going to better our lives over here. But I just, I think that People, uh, realistic people understand that it's complicated. That this plan has a very positive promise for us, which is sovereignty, and there's a lot of um, problematic issues for us, which we need to solve. And um, when it comes to the part of sovereignty, of course, we want to see that happening. But commitment to establishment of a Palestinian state is something that most of the leaders here in Judea and Samaria understand that it's something that we cannot support and should not happen. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Israel, as a, as a former New Yorker and a concerned Israeli, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the statistics that show that support for Israel among Democrats and perhaps among American Jews uh, is dropping. Uh, overnight, we even heard about a letter being circulated through members of the House to rally uh, the entire party against annexation or the application of sovereignty. Is this a concern? First of all, it's a concern for the American Jews. I mean, if the Democratic Party becomes socialist, 
revolutionary or radical extremist, uh, American Jews uh, will be facing a huge onslaught of hatred. And uh, what's going on recently in terms of uh, attacks against Jews in New York and New Jersey and synagogues in Los Angeles and Richmond will only exponentially uh, expand. Uh, so I guess we'll need more land here in order to absorb uh, the uh, many Jews who will be forced to come. Uh, but the point is that uh, at the present moment, we have the ear of the American administration. I'm a little bit older than some of the others, and for the past 40 or 50 years, I've heard from our Israeli left and those that support them that we must be in tune with the American administration. How can we uh, create facts on the ground when the Americans are against it. Now we have an American administration that supports us and they still don't want it. So their arguments are hollow and uh, the so-called threat of the Democratic Party not supporting, uh, they have done so in the past. Uh, Republicans have done so in the past. We have to set our own policy and work very hard in Congress in order to get support that does not cancel out anything that is legally and uh, morally and justifiably ours and a need for our future. Okay, thank you for that. Um, again, a follow-up question, uh, which is related. Uh, the government has been sending out messages, the Israeli government has been sending out messages over the last few weeks, uh, declaring that, uh, that the move might be delayed. At first they were talking about July 1st, and then they said a couple of weeks, and now we're talking about it needs to be done until September. Uh, should the Democrats win in November, um, and this, and if this doesn't happen until then, you can probably forget about U.S. approval of annexation for the reasons that uh, you listed above. Um, would you recommend seizing the, the window of opportunity now rather than waiting for a better deal that is more acceptable to the to the uh, leadership of uh, of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, like uh, like Miri pointed out? First of all, we have to. Uh excuse the pun, Trump the part that Abbas has said he's a thousand times no to the plan. They haven't entered in negotiations. And I think uh, the four year window that has been referred to should be shortened uh, for every continued pay for slave program that Arab terrorists get money for killing Jews, take off months. If they don't have an educational program for coexistence, take off a year if they refuse to recognize the Jewishness of the state of Israel or the Zionism, take off a year. Why give them four years? That has to be a attack that we have to approach. Secondly, the whole idea, and I hope that we're also talking about people who have read the plan, the conditions set for a so-called Palestinian Arab state, in my opinion, are impossible for the Arabs to accept. So we're not talking about a Palestinian state. What we're talking for is Israel twiddling its thumbs until someone in the American administration says, okay, go ahead. Between that and moving on ourselves, that is the argument between ourselves, not between us and the Arabs. The Arabs are not even a part of this uh, plan, and I think we should move ahead on that condition. It's between us and the Americans. So let me clarify, you, you want to move ahead with, with what's currently being put on the table? Uh, as we used to say in the 1930s and 40s, another dunam and another goat. They are giving us now sovereignty over 30%, over the possibility that perhaps 70% might come a Palestinian state when the Arabs said they don't want that. They want 100%. So we take the 30 and we continue the same situation, or you want to call it the status quo, that we've had for the past 53 years until finally we can move ahead again because seems that their rejectionism ever since the days of the mandate and, and the early days of the state continues. They cannot accept us as a Jewish entity anywhere in any uh, configuration of borders in what we call the land of Israel. Okay, I'd like to hear also from Gary and Simcha specifically about this question, whether, whether, we sh whether Israel should be using uh, the window that's left uh, with the Trump administration. Um, on the 30% that we're discussing or, or wait for something better? Uh, ladies first. Okay. 
Talia, can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it so well. Yes, so um, we've heard what Israel has to say about whether or not uh, you take what you can get, which is really use what's left of the Trump administration uh, to, to uh, go with uh, declaring sovereignty over as, as whatever you can, which is um, at the moment around 30% of the territories, or do you think that it's worthwhile waiting for perhaps a re-election of, of, of uh, President Trump and, and maybe getting a better deal? What are, you, what are your thoughts? It's, it's the question of what, what is the now, and we are committing it to the other parts of the the plan and a different administration may take this forward and force us into something that in the first hand wasn't good for us. So yes, there's voices here, perhaps not in any price. Um, anyway, I think that in Israel, the inner dialogue here between the leadership and the, the government, and that's what we expect from our elected officials, is to create a situation, to bring us government, to bring us sovereignty, the people over here. I think this is something that I hope would happen even if the Trump uh, plan doesn't uh, come across in the end. Okay, so not at any price. That's uh, the key. The key uh, sentence I'm getting from you. Uh, Simha, do you have the same not in any price. Oh, sorry, sorry, um, Mary. Can you say one more thing. Can you hear me? Yeah, please, please finish. Not in any price because if we are only going to be Israeli communities themselves but not on the territories around them, it may even put us in a worse situation. We have to have an, a, a, a territorial continuity in order to take care of the area, to solve problems, to take care of the residents, for me to receive what I need for my government to be, to be present over here. But if we create a, a map of holes of sovereign islands here and there, um, I think it may put us in a very problematic situation, but I don't think that we should be um, at, um, saying Kaddish, you would say in Hebrew. I don't think that we should be saying like the end prayer on this, on this plan yet. I think that we need to request to see the maps. What changes can we do? We still have a window of opportunities of maybe a month or two months. And this is a window that we have to take advantage together with our friends in the American administration. I think there's, there's not a time for despair yet. We still have an opportunity to make this plan better for Israel because I believe that that was the original intentions of, the, of this plan, of the administration, to do something that would be good for Israel. Okay, Simcha, your, uh, your thoughts on that? So my thoughts are um, just like Miri's, um, not, not, in, not in every price, definitely. Um, they're talking about stopping, uh, that we can't build, um, stopping uh, building in our areas. They're talking about, uh, again, giving away 70% of the area. So definitely not in every price. Uh, it would be amazing if it happens, but, but this, you have to think more and get, uh, get to a, a better deal for us. Okay, um, I want to ask you, I want to go back to the issue of, um, of the establishment of a Palestinian state because it, it keeps coming on as the kind of other side of the coin. Um, Miri, do you believe uh, that member of Knesset, Miki Zal, who actually speaks for the Prime Minister uh, and vowed that there would never be a Palestinian state, or do you think that this is something that could actually, could actually envelop, develop? I'm not sure I understood. Miki Zohar has repeatedly said that there will be no Palestinian state. And he, he, as we know, is very close to the Prime Minister. Um, do you believe them? I know that the Prime Minister have been, has been speaking, his famous um, speech, the Bar-Ilan speech about the two-state solution. Um, I, I, I don't know enough about what specifically this MK says or another MK says. I think that we need um, an official promise and word from the Prime Minister of Israel in order to be maybe a bit more calm. Um, but I also think that we should change the paradigm of speaking about this area because every time you, ra you raise uh, the Palestinian state, it brings us into deep fear. But if we replace that with speaking about 
seeing how the Palestinians can have a better um, governing system on themselves. How can we make their lives easier? How can there be more um, opportunities to cooperate? I think that brings us um, an easier channel of conversation, something that both sides here can agree upon. And if every time we jump to the end game political structure, we'll be stuck in the disagreement, we won't be able to achieve anything new. And I think this conversation, again, from May, it was so promising in the beginning, and somehow it has sunk back to the situation of where we both sides disagree and don't manage to find something that we can actually work on together. And that, that's a bit of my fear of where we are in this in the situation today. You believe that um, that a solution can be reached that both sides are happy with? It, it sounds like that's where you're heading. I don't think that the end game political uh, answer is something that we can agree on right now. But I think there's other things that we can improve over here. And anyway, in order to create any different political structure, you would need the local leaderships to get along together to achieve something. And I personally, on a, on a personal level, not as a representative, I feel that if we work on that, if we work on the local populations over here, having more contact with each other, sitting down, tentatives being arrested a day later, the Palestinian uh, person from, I think, Bethlehem, who takes part in coexistence conversations with settlers, he interviewed to one of the biggest Israeli channels, and he was arrested by the Palestinian police two days later. If this is the situation today, then there's no point speaking about an end game solution. There's much crucial things that we need to change for both, for, for everybody, for the sake of everybody living here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Israel, earlier this week, uh, the JPC spoke to Mr. Dr. Saeed el I'm sure you're very familiar with him and his work. Um, he told us that if Netanyahu annexed even one inch of land, the PA will collapse, uh, and this will be the end, uh, the end of a, a, a any kind of uh, solution. Are you afraid um, that this might lead to a single binational state uh, where Jews would lose their majority? Um, and might even have to choose eventually between between the Jewish and uh, democratic characters of the country. Well, if you accept that Mr. Arakat has said anything truthful in the past 40 years, then I can answer the question properly. But if I assume that he said that and he really meant it, uh, it shows that basically the Palestinian Arabs, as they are referred to, are not interested in the state or improving their lives. All they're interested in is doing Israel harm. That's the first point. The second point is demographically, I don't agree that all those numbers that are bandied about, such as two million Arabs, but let's leave that aside. We absorbed Arabs in 1948, they're full citizens, and we've even had Supreme Court justices that are Arabs. We are the democratic society in the Middle East. We, Israel, are protecting Arabs better than 22 other Arab countries. The future of Arabs living in this area, whether full Israeli citizens, members of some autonomy, or perhaps even a confederation with Jordan in some form, are much better off than in a Palestinian state. That's their choice to make. We are open to absorb or to coexist with the Arabs as the best possible if the security arrangements are so and there's an end to hostilities. I would suggest that Mr. Arakat don't uh, push that idea of doing away with the Palestinian Authority because then he won't have a car or a job. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just want to make a technical note that there were reporters who began to type in questions in the chat section and then stopped mid midway through. So if you do have more questions, please send them in. Um, uh, Simcha, the next question is directed at you. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. It's from a reporter. Um, you, all three of you have been talking about fears you have for your family uh, in the event of a Palestinian state being uh, um, established at your door. Um, many would say that you are bringing the danger upon yourself by being there in the first place. Uh, how would you respond? Okay, so first of all, I have a history of terrorist attacks in our family. My uh, sister was attacked in Jerusalem uh, in 2001. 
she was injured, uh, almost died. She's fine. Today she's fine uh, with five kids. I went there, terrorist attacks. I learned in, uh, in Atzmona, in, uh, in Aza. And again, a terrorist attack, uh, five of my friends were killed and uh, 30 were injured. Um, I live in Ateret. Ateret is a part of Israel. There's no reason to, for the Arabs to, to have these terrorist attacks. I mean, if they want to live together uh, by peace, uh, I don't think living in fear is, I don't, I'm not living in fear. Um, I, I have, uh, I believe in God. I believe that God, uh, uh, decides for us and, um, and saying that we are bringing this on a pun of ourselves is like telling, uh, a lady who was wearing a short sleeve, uh, skirt. Yeah. Oh yeah. You should be raped because you have a, you know, you're bringing it on upon yourself. So I, I don't really understand the question. Okay, so first of all, thank you for your honest answer, and I am very sorry for your losses. Um, and Mary, do you have a different response uh, to that accusation? Well, you shouldn't be there in the first place. And you're still on mute. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. When I introduced myself before, I said, this is my home. I was born here. My parents came here. We have the deep historical connection to this area, but it's also, it's, it's our home. And I think that anybody that can accuse us by us simply, I would expect the most people that I've chosen to live here. Um, I don't uh, converse about the fact that other people that have different political strives should be sent away from their homes. And I don't think that I should be treated that way. I think today we, we understand that the land of Israel is holy and important for three different religions. Yes, it's the land of the Jewish people. That is something that is acknowledged worldwide, that the Jewish people have a right to live in the land of Israel. Maybe in which parts of it, maybe that's the, that's the, the conversation. Um, but anybody that would come and take me, you should be, uh, it's your fault for living there in the first place. I feel that we lack a very basic a level of, of, of human empathy in order to have a conversation. I mean, yes, there's a conflict. Yes, there's contradicting and uh, political strives. I understand that. But um, that's why I think that we should look forward, understand that we have our deep connection to this area. That's not, that's not going to go anywhere. This place will continue being part of the Israeli, um, the, the most important place to Israel. And we have to speak practically. How is that possible? But coming here and blaming me for living here in the first place, or think being born here in the first place, is something that will bring us nowhere. Thank you, Miri. Um, Israel, the next question is directed at you. Uh, Jordan, which is a country we've had peace with for 26 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and other Arab states, um, who we are coming, becoming closer and closer to over the last years, uh, perhaps because of moves by our current government to improve relations, um, as well as Europe, uh, have been threatening uh, against ramifications of, of uh, annexing the territory. Uh, are you worried about this? Um, are you worried about how it might impact the public in terms of uh, the, top, the public being held responsible for something that its leadership chose to do? I wouldn't say that I'm worried. I'm, I'm, I'm aghast at the lack of thought that goes into this threatening um, mode, of both of Jordan, uh, which will probably be, if he doesn't allow Israel to control most of the area of Judea and Samaria in some form or other, will probably lose his kingdom to the Palestinian population that lives there in Jordan. And the Europeans, uh, I, I don't have very high expectations of them with the developing anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, uh, not to talk about what happened 70 years ago, and the attitude of the EU and the boycott and the millions of dollars going into supporting the peace industry of the NGOs that are subverting Israel and probably causing Arabs more problems than they are the Jews in this area. It's a wrong-headed policy. It's immoral. And it, it doesn't have any diplomatic or political sense to it. 
so uh, I feel very uh, um, uh, upset that uh, so-called <laughs> rational thinking people will bury themselves deeper and deeper into the so-called pro-Palestinian position, which is not going to help anybody. We've tried disengaging from Gaza in 2005. That was a two-state solution. That was territorial compromise. It got us nowhere. So uh, I think that the Trump plan should be grabbed by the Arabs. Uh, I'm, if there's any fear or anxiety on my part, is that uh, they will move forward. I don't think they will, and therefore I feel confident that we can go forward on the Trump plan. But to have uh, Jordan or European Union uh, swords dangling over our heads when it's our security, our future, our country involved, it doesn't bother me, it just disappoints me. Okay, thank you for that. So, so you addressed a lot about um, whether a country should be directing its, its uh, domestic policy towards what other people have to say. Um, let's talk a little bit about what people in the country have to say. Uh, we all know that there is a rift, uh, perhaps even a growing rift between uh, the communities, the, the populations in uh, beyond the green line uh, and the rest of the country, uh, whether, whether, they be, uh, whether they be secular or, or perhaps from other, from other um, ethnicities or otherwise. Um, current polls are showing that half of the Israeli public is still uh, supportive of a two-state solution. Um, I guess this question is for all three of you uh, because we do have a little bit of time left and I would like to hear what you have to say because it's something that, that, that um, you know, it's close to the heart for everybody. Are you not worried that these kinds of moves will continue to widen the gap between, between your communities and the rest of Israel? Who goes first? Uh, let's start with Simcha because we haven't heard him in a few minutes. Okay, so I think that most of the people that live in Israel have, haven't been in these parts of, of Israel. They have no idea um, where it is. They have no idea what you can see from here. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure what, what, if they really know what it means to have a two state, what it means uh, security wise. I'm, I'm sitting outside of my house. I can see all the buildings of Tel Aviv from my house. I'm just imagining what happened in Aza uh, having their own state and uh, missiles being shooting towards uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, so I think most of the people that are, are, are pro, uh, are pro they don't really understand what it means. Um, can you hear your response, please? I'm not familiar with these polls, but I, I don't feel that. I feel that more and more people are coming to visit here. I feel that uh, we are making also an effort. We want people to understand what Judea and Samaria is about. And like Simcha said, when pe the people in Israel, they, they, they just want quiet, they want peace. They want maybe a bit of, they want the political conversation to be you know, away from them. And I think when people come here, and they visit Ateret, they visit my home, Neve Tzuf, they see in their eyes what Simcha is speaking about, how close and how strategic our communities are with, their, um, with them being overlooking the Israel, Israel's big cities, the, the international airports. They understand that these areas cannot be in the hands of a Palestinian state that may shift. It, it's, uh, the, admin, the Palestinian leadership can change tomorrow and they can choose to go to war. And it will just be so much easier for them to fight Israel if they rule some of the most important strategic areas over here. I don't think that is the main reason why we're here. Like I said, we are here because we have the right to live here. But I also think that the strategic issue um, is a big issue. And when people visit here, when you have Israeli MKs here from e any party, from the Likud, from blue and white, they come here and they have a different understanding of the role that Benjamin, for example, has in its defense of the rest of the state of Israel. And that's why in this situation, I think that, I want to believe that there'll be a shift that more and more Israelis will understand that these parts are crucial for the state of Israel for many different reasons. If it's for our historical identity, if it's for our strategic way to ensure safety of the rest of Israel, even for, you know, areas where young couples today are living over here because Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are just overpopulated and people are choosing to come and live here today because they want to live here, not because anybody is forcing them to move here. 
Um, I want to believe that two, two things will happen. One is that more of the Israeli population will feel connected to these areas. And B, I hope that we won't be facing a very dangerous security situation, which I think that's what creates these polls. If people are fearful that there'll be another intifada and more terrorism, that's when they are willing, perhaps, sometimes to give up part of Israel. I think that in our essence, most of the Israelis want to see that happening. And with, it, when, with this plan, I don't think that Israelis deeply understand, whether if it's our residents or people living in Jerusalem or Modin or any nearby city, we haven't seen the maps. We don't understand exactly how it's going to change life tomorrow or next week. And I think there's a lot of disinformation here that needs to be gapped. And then maybe people will have a, a more firm opinion about this plan and should we or should we not accept it. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Israel, I'll direct the same question to you, but I'll add on uh, another half a question, uh, which, which uh, Mary prompted. If, if the main problem or if one of the problems is the lack of information or the lack of understanding uh, on behalf of the, the rest of the Israelis, as, as she explained, who do you believe is responsible for bridging the gap in information? Or do you need to be doing a better job explaining yourselves? Well, uh, on, on the second part of the question, uh, I would not be doing what the Council of Jewish Communities is doing, which is explaining the plan based on information they really don't have or the real map that they have. Uh, they are assuming, and I think that they're in error in taking too much of a liberty uh, to attack the plan without knowing exactly what's going down. On the second Part of that, of course, I think the government should engage much more. Uh, I know that one of the leaders of uh, Amana, uh, the settlement movement of what used to be called Gush Emunim, Ze'ev Heva, was involved in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Oslo maps. And I think he should be called in on these maps as well. It would probably give us a lot more confidence in the situation. As to the polls, there are a lot of polls. There are elections, and the Likud has always come up as probably the strongest party over the past 30 years, so I'm not interested in that. Polls, if once they get into details, what land or communities would you give away, I'm sure everything will change in terms of those percentages. So I don't really set my policy according to polls that I've seen. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're actually over the time that I promised that we'd need you, but there is one more question that a reporter has submitted. So just a little bit of uh, patience. Um, Simcha, we, be we, we began with you, so we're also gonna finish with you just to, uh, for closure. Um, everybody seems to be against, uh, against the establishment of a, uh, a Palestinian state on this panel for the reasons that you've explained. Um, but would you agree on the principle that both people, uh, both Jews, Jewish Israelis and uh, Palestinian Arabs um, should be receiving equal rights? And do you see uh, coexistence as something that's possible uh, in the event that there is no Palestinian state? So um, I have friends that are Arabs. I have friends, I have workers. I just built a second floor in my house. We had Arabs, about 10 Arabs for a half a year. Um, there are friends, I speak to them. Uh, I, we would, I think we would love to have co coexistence. We would love uh, for them uh, to come and drink coffee in our houses. And if they have uh, weddings, you know, like uh, Israel said, years ago, we went, we did shopping in our villages. It happened. It wasn't, it's not like a dream. Years ago, that was, the, that was what happened here in this area. Um, today, for an Israeli to go into a Palestinian uh, city, it's very, very dangerous. Um, so yes, I would love uh, for Arabs and Israel and Israelis to live together uh, in in peace. That'll be amazing. Okay, uh, that's actually all the time we have today. So, uh, there there were other questions uh, that could come in. Um, oh, as Miri has written in the uh, in the chat box, just so that you know, uh, she's happy to answer any more questions personally. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, speak to her or the other panelists uh, with whom she's in touch uh, as spokesperson of the council, please reach out to me and I'll connect uh, connect you both. Um, so Islam Dad, 
Simcha Schumacher, Miri Maoz Avadia. Uh, thank you to the three of you for taking the time to join the call. Uh, technical issues aside, uh, it was a uh, it was a uh, good use of time. Thank you. No problem. Have a great day, everyone. Come visit us in Ateret. And we'll be have very happy.